Welcome to part 8 of lecture 3 of Bloch Body Aerodynamics. So once we have our solution, then we have to do post-processing to get the things that we actually want out of the solution. So we, once we have a completed or a converged solution, this is basically a huge set of numbers. It's not very digestible by humans. So post-processing is essentially the omnibus name for a variety of tasks during which visual, um, which is more qualitative, as well as quantitative data are extracted from the converged solution. So here's an example um, of something that you might do with post-processing. Um, this is uh, from the textbook and it shows the static pressure distribution uh, all over uh, the surface of a vehicle. Um, this is of course normalized as a pressure coefficient and we can see the regions of high pressure where we'd expect them at essentially at stagnation points. The regions of low pressure correspond to the regions of highest velocity and the sort of greenish regions correspond to um, sort of pressure that's roughly equal to the atmospheric pressure. So there's a couple of ways to determine the net forces that act on a car uh, using CFD. We can integrate the surface pressure and the shear stress distributions or we can use control volume analysis over like a box that surrounds the car, um, conceptually similar to what we did in the example in lecture two. Most CFD software packages have built-in methods for the de determining the forces via surface integration, um, but in general, the accuracy of the control volume method is gonna be a little bit better, but it's a lot more difficult to implement. We won't really implement that in the work we do in this course because of the challenges of doing that. It typically requires extracting a lot of data um, maybe do a third-party program like MATLAB and then writing a bunch of code to do the analysis. Um, the, the book actually has a pretty good overview of post-processing methods um, in section 14.1.9.4. Um, this sort of shows very, various useful types of visualizations. So I'm not going to replicate that here, um, but I'll actually bring up the ebook and have a quick look through those now. So let's have a look here and at some various uh, ways of doing prose processing. Um, so we already looked at this result. This is surface static pressure distributions. Um, here's uh, skin friction uh, coefficient. Um, so it would be the combination of these two together that would be used to determine the drag. So we can see there's very low skin friction where there's separated flow. That's what we would expect. Um, and high skin friction where there's fast attached flow with high velocity. We can then take those two and divide them into, uh, or sort of add them up vectorially and then divide them into a direct a components that are parallel to the, the car sort of direction, which is the contributions of drag, and perpendicular in the vertical direction for lift. Um, so we can see where we're getting contributions to drag and where we're getting contributions to lift using the combination of the direction of the surface, the skin friction, and uh, the surface pressures. So we get sort of uh, high vertical force acting on the roof of the car, um, and we get high drag contributions uh, from uh, the forward-facing surfaces, basically at the uh, front-facing grill, the windshield, and the front facing parts of the side mirrors. Note that some of these, especially for the drag, both true for both, but especially for the drag, note that scale goes to negative values. So there are local regions where there's sort of a negative contribution to drag. Um, and that's normal. You'd expect that there's a combination of both. But of course, the overall integrated effect um, will always be positive. Another way we can look at this is by looking at the drag development along the sort of direction of the length of the vehicle. Um, and we can see how the drag is building up as sort of an integration of everything in the transverse plane. We see that the drag begins at zero, rises sharply because of the, um, the stagnation point at the leading edge, um, dips as the flow goes around the, the front corners because we saw there was some sort of negative drag contributions there, and then sort of is pretty constant over the hood. Um, drops again through sort of the middle of the vehicle and then rapidly rises where the flow separates 
on the back window and again on the trunk uh, or past the trunk lid. Uh, we can get the directions of the aerodynamic forces acting on different components of the vehicle. We can get wall streamlines. So this is an interesting idea. Um, wall streamlines are a little bit counterintuitive because of course the velocity is zero at the wall. So this is not really streamlines. What these are is essentially joined up vectors of wall shear stress, um, which is a vectorial quantity. Um, and this is exactly the same information you would get from an oil film flow visualization. So this is a very useful way to compare CFD results to experiments. We get a total pressure coefficient distribution. This is essentially going to show us where uh, the total pressure coefficient is 1. This is equal to the free stream value. Where it, uh, it's lower um, we're, we're get, than that, we're basically getting some losses in, in the flow. If we were doing a simulation of heat transfer, we could get heat transfer coefficients as well. And one can even do acoustic simulations and get sound pressure levels. We can look at streamlines in 3D and look at how the flow moves over the vehicle or through the vehicle if we're doing a very detailed simulation. Streamlines are essentially just um, stringing together the velocity vectors to follow the path that a fluid particle takes. We can do uh, contour plots of flow through cutting planes. This is something you'll do extensively in this course. Um, here is a non-dimensional velocity distribution. We can also do this for pressure fields, for example. Um, we see the low velocity in the wake of the vehicle um, and the high velocity over the regions where the flow is uh, rapidly accelerating in the underbody before the separation occurs there. We can look at velocity vectors that sort of help us visualize the flow field on 2D planes. And we can look at uh, contours on planes at a variety of cuts to sort of see how things evolve in space. We can look at isosurfaces, though these tend to not always be all that useful. They look pretty, but are not particularly helpful. Okay, so let's continue here now. Now that we've had a look at some of uh, the w things that you can post-process out of a CFD solution. If we want to have accurate results, we need to make sure that our result is not dependent on our choice of computational grid. So just generating a grid and getting a solution does not ensure that it's the right answer or even that it's the best answer that the solver is going to give you. So basically we need to ensure that our solution doesn't depend on the grid. So the basic approach to doing this is to refine the grid ideally by a factor of 2 in every direction and then rerun the solution. If the answer doesn't change to within the desired precision then it's okay. If it does then we have to refine again and repeat. There's another way that we can uh, do this uh, which estimates the error due to the presence of a finite grid. So this is described um, by Roche, and I'll put a link to uh, this textbook on Blackboard in case you're interested in checking out the book. Um, basically, you can look at the solution quality by using Richardson extrapolation, and I won't get into the details of that method here, but what we can do is, let's say we had three solutions on three different grids, which are shown by the points connected by the lines here for two different overall performance quantities. It's possible from that data to extrapolate and estimate what the value of the parameters would be at an infinitely fine grid. Note this is 1 over the grid point, so 0 corresponds to an infinitely fine grid. And then we can compare the values we have to that final value and say, well, if we want to use this medium grid, um, that's going to entail an error of whatever, some percent and this one entails an error of whatever else percent. So um, if we can sort of, at least it, even though it may not be a grid independent solution we use, it allows us to put a uh, bound or, or an estimate of the uncertainty in the answer. Modern large computations typically require running in parallel. This basically means using multiple CPU cores, either on a single computer or across multiple computers. To do this well, you have to have a reasonable number of cells per core. Scaling describes how much less time the calculation takes due to the use of these multiple cores. So with a perfect or 100% scaling, 
doubling the number of cores would cut the solution time in half. Um, generally, it's not that good, um, and uh, that you don't get that perfect performance. If you over-parallelize, that tends to lead for so much time for the different processes to talk to each other, basically sending information back and forth, that the calculation doesn't get any faster. So a good gener general guideline is that if you have 100 to 200,000 cells per core at minimum, you're probably going to get pretty good scaling. If you've got a really well-written code, you can actually end up getting greater than 100% parallel uh, scaling efficiency. Um, this is a case that I tested with OpenFoam using a 20 million cell problem um, with 64 cores being the baseline performance here uh, in terms of my speed. And what I saw when I went to 128 cores and 512 cores is on a per core basis, the calculation actually got faster. So this is a, a really impressive and a, a sign of a, how well written of a code open foam is. The next step for improving industrially relevant CFD is the use of hybrid RANS LES. So we talked a little bit about LES earlier. This is very expensive. It's not really practical in industry context for some time yet because you need a really fine grid and fine time resolution, especially near the walls. But there's some hybrid approaches that have been invented um, called detached eddy simulations, or in the most uh, recent of these is improved delayed detached eddy simulations, IDD. Yes. This uses RANs where the flow is uh, well behaved and has attached boundary layers and uses LES in separated boundary layers and in the flow far away from the walls. This has an intermediate computational cost and this is really starting to become computation or industrially feasible. 